Book 7, Chapter 7 of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The second of April had arrived, and Luther behoved to take leave of his friends after writing a note to langer to intimate that he would spend the following thursday or friday at erfurt he bade adieu to his colleagues turning to melancthon he said to him in a tone which betrayed emotion if i do not return and my enemies put me to death o oh, my brother cease not to teach and remain firm in the truth labour in my stead since i shall not be able to labour any longer for myself if you live it matters little though i perish then committing himself to the hand of him who is faithful and true luther took his seat and quitted wittemberg the town council had provided him with a modest carriage with a cloth covering which might be put on or off at pleasure the imperial herald clad in his insignia and wearing the imperial eagle was on horseback in front followed by his servant next followed luther schurf amsdorf and suaven in their carriage the friends of the gospel the citizens of wittemberg in deep emotion were invoking god and shedding tears such was luther's departure he soon observed that the hearts of those whom he met were filled with gloomy forebodings at leipzig no honour was paid to him he only received the usual present of wine at naumburg he met a priest probably j langer a man of stern zeal who carefully preserved in his study the portrait of the famous jerome savonarola of ferrara who was burned at florence in fourteen hundred and ninety eight by order of pope alexander the sixth as a martyr to liberty and morality as well as a confessor of evangelical truth having taken the portrait of the italian martyr the priest came up to luther and held out the portrait to him without speaking luther understood what the dumb figure intimated but his intrepid soul remained firm it is satan said he who by these terrors would fain prevent a confession of the truth from being made in the assembly of the princes because he foresees the blow which this will give to his kingdom adhere firmly to the truth which thou hast perceived said then the priest to him gravely and thy god will also adhere firmly to thee having spent the night at naumburg where the burgomaster had hospitably entertained him luther arrived next evening at weimar he was scarcely a moment there when he heard loud cries in all directions they were publishing his condemnation look said the herald to him he looked and his astonished eyes beheld imperial messengers traversing the town and posting up the imperial edict which ordered his writings to be laid before the magistrates luther had no doubt that these harsh measures were exhibited beforehand to deter him from coming that he might afterwards be condemned for having refused to appear well doctor will you go on said the imperial herald to him in alarm yes replied luther though put under interdict in every town i will go on i confide in the emperor's safe conduct at weimar luther had an audience of the elector's brother duke john who was then residing there the prince invited him to preach he consented and from his heart now under deep emotion came forth the words of life john voigt the friend of frederick myconius a franciscan monk heard him and being converted to evangelical doctrine quitted the convent two years after at a later period he became professor of theology at wittemberg the duke gave luther the money necessary for his journey from weimar the reformer proceeded to erfurt it was the town of his youth and he hoped to see his friend langer provided as he had written him he could enter the town without danger he was still three or four leagues off near the village of nora 
when he saw a troop of horsemen appear in the distance were they friends or were they enemies shortly crotus the rector of the university eobanus hesse melanchthon's friend whom luther called the king of poets Euricius Cordus, John Draco, and others, to the number of forty, members of the Senate, the University, and the Municipality, all on horseback, saluted him with acclamation. A multitude of the inhabitants of Erfurt covered the road, and gave loud expression to their joy. All were eager to see the mighty man who had ventured to declare war against the Pope a young man of twenty-eight named justus jonas had got the start of the party jonas after studying law at erfurt had been appointed rector of the university in fifteen hundred and nineteen illumined by the evangelical light which then radiated in all directions he felt desirous to become a theologian i believe wrote erasmus to him that god has elected you as an instrument to spread the glory of his son jesus all jonas's thoughts were turned to wittemberg and luther some years before when only a student of law being of an active enterprising spirit he had set out on foot accompanied by some friends and in order to reach erasmus then at brussels had traversed forests infested by robbers and towns ravaged by the plague will he not now confront other dangers in order to accompany the reformer to worms he earnestly begged the favour and luther consented thus met these two doctors who were to labour through life in the renovation of the church divine providence gathered around luther men destined to be the light of germany the melanchthons the amsdorfs the bugenhagens the jonases on his return from worms jonas was appointed provost of the church of wittemberg and doctor in theology jonas said luther is a man whose life would deserve to be purchased at a large price in order to detain him on the earth no preacher ever surpassed him in the gift of captivating his hearers pomeranus is an expositor said melanchthon and i am a dialectician jonas is an orator the words flow from his lips with surpassing grace and his eloquence is overpowering but luther is beyond us all it seems that nearly about the same time a companion of luther's childhood one of his brothers joined the escort the deputation turned their steeds and horsemen and footmen surrounding luther's carriage entered the town of erfurt at the gate in the squares and streets where the poor monk had so often begged his bread the crowd of spectators was immense luther dismounted at the augustine convent where the gospel had consoled his heart langer received him with joy usingen and some of the more aged fathers showed great coolness there was a general desire to hear him preach and though he was interdicted from doing it the herald himself could not resist the desire and consented sunday after easter the augustine church at erfurt was crowded that friar who formerly opened the doors and swept the church mounted the pulpit and having opened the bible read these words peace be with you and when he had so said he showed them his hands and his side john chapter twenty verses nineteen and twenty all the philosophers doctors and writers said he have exerted themselves to show how man may obtain eternal life and have not succeeded i will now tell you this has in all ages been the great question accordingly luther's hearers redoubled their attention there are two kinds of works continued the reformer works foreign to ourselves these are good works and our own works these are of little value one builds a church another goes on a pilgrimage to st james or st peter a third fasts prays takes the cowl walks barefoot a fourth does something else all these works are nothing and will perish for our own works have no efficacy in them but i am now going to tell you what is the genuine work 
god raised a man again from the dead even the lord jesus christ that he might crush death destroy sin and shut the gates of hell such is the work of salvation the devil thought that he had the lord in his power when he saw him between the two thieves suffering the most ignominious martyrdom cursed of god and men but the divinity displayed its power and annihilated sin death and hell christ has vanquished this is the grand news and we are saved by his work not by our own the pope gives a very different account but i maintain that the holy mother of god herself was saved neither by her virginity nor maternity neither by her purity nor her works but solely by means of faith and by the works of god while luther was speaking a sudden noise was heard one of the galleries gave a crack and seemed as if it were going to give way under the pressure of the crowd some rushed out and others sat still terror-struck the orator stopped for a moment and then stretching out his hand exclaimed with a loud voice fear nothing there is no danger the devil is seeking in this way to prevent me from proclaiming the gospel but he shall not succeed at these words those who were running out stopped astonished and riveted to the spot the assembly calmed and luther without troubling himself with the attempts of the devil continued you will perhaps say to me you tell us a great deal about faith tell us also how we can obtain it yes well i will tell you our lord jesus christ says peace be with you behold my hands in other words behold o man it is i i alone who have taken away thy sin and ransomed thee and now thou hast peace saith the lord i did not eat the fruit of the tree resumed luther neither did you eat it but we received the sin which adam has transmitted to us and are guilty of it in like manner i did not suffer on the cross nor did you suffer on it but christ suffered for us we are justified by the work of god and not by our own i am saith the lord thy righteousness and thy redemption let us believe the gospel let us believe st paul and not the letters and decretals of the popes luther after having preached faith as the means of the sinner's justification preaches works as the consequence and evidence of salvation since god has saved us continued he let us so order our works that he may take pleasure in them art thou rich let thy wealth be useful to the poor art thou poor let thy service be useful to the rich if thy toil is useful only to thyself the service which thou pretendest to render to god is mere falsehood there is not a word in the sermon on luther himself no allusion to the circumstances in which he is placed nothing on worms on charles or the nuncios he preaches christ and christ only at this moment when the world has its eyes upon him he is not in the least occupied with himself and herein is the mark of a genuine servant of god luther set out from erfurt and passed through gotha where he again preached myconius adds that at the moment when the people were coming out from the sermon the devil detached from the pediment of the church some stones which had not budged for two centuries the doctor slept in the convent of the benedictines at reinhardsbrunn and thence proceeded to eisenach where he felt indisposed amsdorf jonas schurf and all his friends were alarmed he was bled and the greatest possible attention was paid him even the schultheß of the town john oswald hastened to him with a cordial luther after drinking it fell asleep and was thereby so far recovered that he was able to proceed on the following day whenever he passed the people flocked to see him his journey was a kind of triumphal procession deep interest was felt in beholding the intrepid man who was on the way to offer his head to the emperor and the empire an immense concourse surrounded him 
ah said some of them to him there are so many cardinals and so many bishops at worms they will burn you they will reduce your body to ashes as was done with that of john huss but nothing terrified the monk were they to make a fire said he that would extend from worms to wittemberg and reach even to the sky i would walk across it in the name of the lord i would appear before them i would walk into the jaws of this beer moth and break his teeth and confess the lord jesus christ one day when just going into an inn and while the crowd were as usual pressing around him an officer came up to him and said are you the man who undertakes to reform the papacy how will you succeed yes replied luther i am the man i confide in almighty god whose word and command i have before me the officer affected gave him a milder look and said dear friend there is something in what you say i am the servant of charles but your master is greater than mine he will aid you and guard you such was the impression which luther produced even his enemies were struck at the sight of the multitudes that thronged around him though they have painted the journey in different colours at length the doctor arrived at frankfurt on sunday the fourteenth of april news of luther's advance had reached worms the friends of the pope had thought he would not obey the summons of the emperor albert cardinal archbishop of mentz would have given anything to stop him by the way and new schemes were set on foot for this purpose luther on his arrival at frankfurt took some repose and then announced his approach to spalatin who was at worms with the elector it is the only letter which he wrote during his journey i am getting on says he though satan has striven to stop me on the way by sickness from eisenach to this i have never been without a feeling of languor and am still completely worn out i learn that charles has published an edict to frighten me but christ lives and we shall enter worms in spite of all the barriers of hell and all the powers of the air therefore make ready my lodging the next day luther visited the learned school of william nessa a celebrated geographer of that time be diligent said he to the scholars in the reading of the scriptures and the investigation of truth then placing his right hand on the head of one of the children and his left on another he pronounced a blessing on the whole school while luther blessed the young he was also the hope of the old catherine of holzhausen a widow advanced in years and serving god went to him and said my father and mother told me that god would raise up a man who should oppose the papal vanities and save the word of god i hope you are that man and i wish you for your work the grace and the holy spirit of god these were by no means the sentiments universally entertained at frankfurt john cochleus dean of the church of notre dame was one of those most devoted to the roman church on seeing luther pass through frankfurt on his way to worms he could not suppress his fears he thought the church was in want of devoted defenders and scarcely had luther quitted the town than cochleus set out in his track ready as he says to give his life in defence of the honour of the church there was great alarm in the camp of the pope's friends the heresiarch was at hand every day every hour brought him nearer worms if he entered all was perhaps lost the archbishop albert the confessor glapio and all the politicians about the emperor felt uneasy how can the arrival of this monk be prevented it is impossible to carry him off for he has the emperor's safe conduct stratagem alone can arrest him these intriguers immediately arranged the following plan the emperor's confessor and his high chamberlain paul of amsdorf quit worms in great haste and proceed about ten leagues distant to the castle of ebenburg the residence of francis de seckingen the knight who had offered luther an asylum Busa, a young dominican chaplain to the elector palatine who had been gained to the evangelical doctrine at the heidelberg discussion had then taken refuge in this hotel of the just 
the knight who had no great knowledge of the affairs of religion was easily imposed upon while the disposition of the palatine chaplain favoured the designs of the confessor in fact Bucer was inclined to pacific measures distinguishing between fundamental and secondary points he thought he might sacrifice the latter to unity and peace the chamberlain and the confessor begin their attack they give seckingen and Bucer to understand that it is all over with luther if he goes to worms they assure him that the emperor is ready to send certain learned men to ebenberg there to confer with the doctor under your charge say they to the knight the two parties will be placed we are at one with luther on all essential points say they to Bucer. only some secondary points remain and as to these you will be mediator the knight and the chaplain are shaken the confessor and chamberlain continue the invitation addressed to luther must come from you say they to seckingen and let Bucer be the bearer of it everything was arranged according to their wish let luther only be credulous enough to come to ebenberg his safe conduct will soon expire and then who will be able to defend him luther had arrived at oppenheim his safe conduct was available only for three days longer he sees a troop of horsemen approaching and soon recognizes at their head the Bucer with whom he had such intimate conference at heidelberg these horsemen belong to francis of seckingen said Bucer to him after the first expressions of friendship he sends me to conduct you to his strong castle the emperor's confessor is desirous of a conference with you his influence over charles is unbounded everything may be arranged but beware of aleander jonas amsdorf and schurf knew not what to think Bucer insisted but luther hesitated not i continue my journey was his answer to Bucer, and if the emperor's confessor has anything to say to me he will find me at worms i go where i am called meanwhile spalatin himself began to be troubled and afraid surrounded at worms by the enemies of the reformation he heard them saying that no respect should be paid to the safe conduct of a heretic he became alarmed for his friend and at the moment when the latter was approaching the town a messenger presented himself and said to him on the part of the chaplain don't enter worms this from his best friend the elector's confidant spalatin himself luther unmoved turns his eye on the messenger and replies go and tell your master that were there as many devils in worms as there are tiles upon the roofs i would enter never perhaps was luther so grand the envoy returned to worms with his extraordinary message i was then intrepid said luther a few days before his death i feared nothing god can give man such boldness i know not if at present i would have as much liberty and joy when the cause is good as his disciple mathesius the heart expands giving courage and energy to evangelists and soldiers end of book seven chapter seven book seven chapter eight of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight at length on the morning of the sixteenth of april luther perceived the walls of the ancient city all were looking for him and there was only one thought in worms the young noblemen bernard of hirschfeld and albert of lindenau with six cavaliers and other gentlemen in the suite of the princes to the number of a hundred if we may believe pallavicini unable to restrain their impatience galloped to meet him and surrounded him in order to escort him at the moment of his entry he approached before him pranced the imperial herald decked in all the insignia of his office next came luther in his humble carriage jonas followed on horseback surrounded by the cavaliers a large crowd was waiting in front of the gates 
it was near midday when he passed those walls which so many persons had foretold him he should never leave it was the dinner hour but the moment when the sentinel stationed in the cathedral steeple told the signal everybody ran into the street to see the monk thus was luther in worms two thousand persons accompanied him through the streets there was a rush to meet him the crowd was increasing every moment and was much larger than when the emperor made his entry suddenly relates a historian a man clad in a singular dress carrying a large cross before him as is usual at funerals breaks off from the crowd advances towards luther and then in a loud voice and with the plaintive cadence which is used in saying mass for the repose of the souls of the dead chants the following stanzas as if he had been determined that the very dead should hear them advenisti o desiderabilis quem expectabamus in tenebris thou hast arrived thou whom we longed and waited for in darkness luther's arrival is celebrated by a requiem if the story is true it was the court fool of one of the dukes of bavaria who gave luther one of those warnings remarkable at once for wisdom and irony of which so many instances are furnished by these individuals but the clamour of the multitude soon drowned the de profundis of the cross-bearer the train could scarcely proceed through the moving mass at length the imperial herald stopped before the hotel of the knights of rhodes here lodged two of the elector's councillors frederick of thun and philip of feilich as well as the marshal of the empire ulrich of pappenheim luther got out of his carriage and on alighting said the lord will be my defence i entered worms said he afterwards in a covered car in my frock everybody ran into the street to see friar martin the news of his arrival filled the elector of saxony and aleander with alarm the young and elegant archbishop albert who held a mean between those two parties was amazed at luther's boldness had i not more courage than he said luther it is true i never should have been seen in worms charles v immediately assembled his council the councillors in the emperor's confidence repaired in haste to the palace for they too were in dismay luther is arrived said charles what must be done modo bishop of palermo and chancellor of flanders if we are to receive luther's own statement replied we have long consulted on this subject let your imperial majesty speedily get rid of this man did not sigismond cause john huss to be burned there is no obligation either to give or observe a safe conduct to a heretic no said charles what has been promised must be performed there was nothing for it therefore but to make the reformer appear while the councils of the great were thus agitated on the subject of luther there were many men in worms who rejoiced that they were able at length to behold this illustrious servant of god in the first rank among them was capito chaplain and counsellor to the archbishop of mentz this remarkable man who a short time before had preached the gospel in switzerland with great freedom thought it due to the place which he then occupied to pursue a course which exposed him to a charge of cowardice from the evangelists and of dissimulation from the romans he had however preached the doctrine of faith clearly at metz and on his departure had succeeded in supplying his place by a young preacher full of zeal named hedio in this town the ancient see of the primate of the german church the word of god was not bound the gospel was eagerly listened to in vain did the monks strive to preach the gospel after their own way and employ all the means in their power in order to arrest the general impulse they had no success but capito even while he preached the new doctrine labored to continue in friendship with those who persecuted it he flattered himself with others of the same sentiments that he would thus be of great utility to the church 
to hear them talk it might have been supposed that if luther was not burnt if all the lutherans were not excommunicated it was owing entirely to capito's influence over the archbishop albert cochleus dean of frankfurt arriving in worms almost at the same time with luther immediately waited upon capito who being apparently at least on very good terms with aleander introduced cochleus to him thus serving as a connecting link between the two greatest enemies of the reformer capito doubtless thought that he would do a great service to the cause of christ by all this management but it cannot be said that any good resulted from it the event almost always belies these calculations of human wisdom and proves that a decided course while it is the most frank is also the most wise meanwhile the crowd continued around the hotel of rhodes at which luther had alighted some looked upon him as a prodigy of wisdom and others as a monster of iniquity the whole town wished to see him the first hours were left him to recover from his fatigue and converse with his most intimate friends but as soon as evening came counts barons knights gentlemen ecclesiastics and citizens flocked in upon him all even his greatest enemies were struck with the bold step he had taken the joy which appeared to animate him the power of his eloquence and the lofty elevation and enthusiasm which made the influence of this simple monk almost irresistible many attributed this grandeur to something within him partaking of the divine while the friends of the pope loudly declared that he was possessed with a devil call followed call and the crowd of curious visitors kept luther standing to a late period of the night the next morning friday the seventeenth of april ulrich of pappenheim hereditary marshal of the empire summoned him to appear at four o'clock p m in the presence of his imperial majesty and the states of the empire luther received the summons with profound respect thus everything is fixed and luther is going to appear for jesus christ before the most august assembly in the world he was not without encouragement the ardent knight ulrich von hutten was then in the castle of ebenburg not being able to appear at worms for leo x had asked charles to send him to rome bound hand and foot he desired to stretch out a friendly hand to luther and on the same day seventeenth of april wrote to him borrowing the words of a king of israel the lord hear thee in the day of trouble the name of the god of jacob defend thee send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of zion remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice o dearly beloved luther my respected father fear not and be strong the counsel of the wicked has beset you they have opened their mouths upon you like roaring lions but the lord will rise up against the wicked and scatter them fight then valiantly for christ as for me i also will fight boldly would to god i were permitted to see the wrinkling of their brows but the lord will cleanse his vine which the wild boar of the forest has laid waste may christ preserve you Busser did what hutten was unable to do he came from ebenburg to worms and remained the whole time beside his friend four o'clock having struck the marshal of the empire presented himself it was necessary to set out and luther made ready he was moved at the thought of the august congress before which he was going to appear the herald walked first after him the marshal and last the reformer the multitude thronging the streets was still more numerous than on the previous evening it was impossible to get on it was in vain to cry give place the crowd increased at length the herald seeing the impossibility of reaching the town hall caused some private houses to be opened and conducted luther through gardens and secret passages to the place of meeting the people perceiving this rushed into the houses on the steps of the monk of wittemberg or placed themselves at the windows which looked into the gardens while great numbers of persons got up on the roofs 
the tops of the houses the pavement every place above and below was covered with spectators arrived at length at the town luther and those who all accompanied him were again unable because of the crowd to reach the door give way give way not one stirred at last the imperial soldiers forced a passage for luther the people rushed forward to get in after him but the soldiers kept them back with their halberds luther got into the interior of the building which was completely filled with people as well in the antechambers as at the windows there were more than five thousand spectators german italian spanish etc luther advanced with difficulty as he was at length approaching the door which was to bring him in the presence of his judges he met a valiant knight the celebrated general george of freundsburg who four years afterwards at the head of the german lasquinets couched his lance on the field of pavia and bearing down upon the left wing of the french army drove it into the tocino and in a great measure decided the captivity of the king of france the old general seeing luther pass clapped him on the shoulder and shaking his head whitened in battle kindly said to him poor monk poor monk you have before you a march and an affair the like to which neither i nor a great many captains have ever seen in the bloodiest of our battles but if your cause is just and you have full confidence in it advance in the name of god and fear nothing god will not forsake you a beautiful homage borne by warlike courage to courage of intellect it is the saying of a king he that ruleth his spirit is greater than he that taketh a city at length the doors of the hall being opened luther entered and many persons not belonging to the diet made their way in along with him never had man appeared before an assembly so august the emperor charles v whose dominions embraced the old and the new world his brother the archduke ferdinand six electors of the empire whose descendants are now almost all wearing the crown of kings twenty-four dukes the greater part of them reigning over territories of greater or less extent and among whom are some bearing a name which will afterwards become formidable to the reformation the duke of alva and his two sons eight margraves thirty archbishops bishops or prelates seven ambassadors among them those of the kings of france and england the deputies of ten free towns a great number of princes counts and sovereign barons the nuncios of the pope in all two hundred and four personages such was the court before which martin luther appeared this appearance was in itself a signal victory gained over the papacy the pope had condemned the man yet here he stood before a tribunal which thus far placed itself above the pope the pope had put him under his ban debarring him from all human society and yet here he was convened in honourable terms and admitted before the most august assembly in the world the pope had ordered that his mouth should be for ever mute and he was going to open it before an audience of thousands assembled from the remotest quarters of christendom an immense revolution had thus been accomplished by the instrumentality of luther rome was descending from her throne descending at the bidding of a monk some of the princes seeing the humble son of the miner of mansfeld disconcerted in the presence of the assembly of kings kindly approached him and one of them said fear not them who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul another added when you will be brought before kings it is not you that speak but the spirit of your father that speaketh in you thus the reformer was consoled in the very words of his master by the instrumentality of the rulers of the world during this time the guards were making way for luther who advanced till he came in front of the throne of charles v the sight of the august assembly seemed for a moment to dazzle and overawe him 
all eyes were fixed upon him the agitation gradually calmed down into perfect silence don't speak before you are asked said the marshal of the empire to him and withdrew after a moment of solemn stillness john of eck the chancellor of the archbishop of treves a friend of aleander and who must not be confounded with the theologian of the same name rose up and said in a distinct and audible voice first in latin and then in german martin luther his sacred and invincible imperial majesty has cited you before his throne by the advice and counsel of the states of the holy roman empire in order to call upon you to answer these two questions first do you admit that these books were composed by you at the same time the imperial orator pointed to about twenty books lying on the table in the middle of the hall in front of luther i did not exactly know how they procured them says luther in relating the circumstance it was aleander who had taken the trouble secondly continued the chancellor do you mean to retract these books and their contents or do you persist in the things which you have advanced in them luther without hesitation was going to reply in the affirmative to the former question when his counsel jerome scherf hastily interfering called out read the titles of the books the chancellor going up to the table read the titles the list contained several devotional works not relating to controversy after the enumeration luther said first in latin then in german most gracious emperor gracious princes and lords his imperial majesty asks me two questions as to the first i acknowledge that the books which have been named are mine i cannot deny them as to the second considering that is a question which concerns faith and the salvation of souls a question in which the word of god is interested in other words the greatest and most precious treasure either in heaven or on the earth i should act imprudently were i to answer without reflection i might say less than the occasion requires or more than the truth demands and thus incur the guilt which our saviour denounced when he said whoso shall deny me before men him will i deny before my father who is in heaven wherefore i pray your imperial majesty with all submission to give me time that i may answer without offence to the word of god this reply far from countenancing the idea that there was any hesitation in luther was worthy of the reformer and the assembly it became him to show calmness and circumspection in so grave a matter and to refrain on this solemn moment from everything that might seem to indicate passion or levity moreover by taking a suitable time he would thereby the better prove the immovable firmness of his resolution history shows us many men who by a word uttered too hastily brought great calamities on themselves and on the world luther curbs his naturally impetuous character restrains a tongue always ready to give utterance is silent when all the feelings of his heart are longing to embody themselves in words this self-restraint this calmness so extraordinary in such a man increased his power a hundredfold and put him into a position to answer afterwards with a wisdom power and dignity which will disappoint the expectation of his enemies and confound their pride and malice nevertheless as he had spoken in a respectful and somewhat subdued tone several thought that he was hesitating and even afraid a ray of hope gleamed into the souls of the partisans of rome charles impatient to know the man whose words shook the empire had never taken his eye off him now turning towards one of his courtiers he said with disdain assuredly that is not the man who would ever make me turn heretic then rising up the young emperor withdrew with his ministers to the council chamber the electors with the princes were closeted in another and the deputies of the free towns in a third 
the diet when it again met agreed to grant luther's request it was a great mistake in men under the influence of passion martin luther said the chancellor of treves his imperial majesty in accordance with the goodness which is natural to him is pleased to grant you another day but on condition that you give your reply verbally and not in writing then the imperial herald advanced and reconducted luther to his hotel menaces and cheers succeeded each other as he passed along the most unfavourable reports were circulated among luther's friends the diet is dissatisfied said they the envoys of the pope triumph the reformer will be sacrificed men's passions grew hot several gentlemen hastened to luther's lodgings doctor asked they in deep emotion how does the matter stand it is confidently said that they mean to burn you that won't be continued they or they shall pay for it with their lives and that would have been the result said luther twenty years later at eisleben when quoting these expressions on the other hand luther's enemies were quite elated he has asked time said they he will retract when at a distance he spoke arrogantly but now his courage fails him he is vanquished luther perhaps was the only tranquil person in worms a few moments after his return from the diet he wrote to the imperial counsellor caspianus i write to you from the midst of tumult meaning probably the noise of the crowd outside his hotel i have within this hour appeared before the emperor and his brother i have acknowledged the authorship and declared that to-morrow i will give my answer concerning retraction by the help of jesus christ not one iota of all my works will i retract the excitement of the people and of the foreign troops increased every hour while parties were proceeding calmly to the business of the diet others were coming to blows in the streets the spanish soldiers proud and merciless gave offence by their insolence to the burghers of the town one of these satellites of charles finding in a bookseller's shop the papal bull with a commentary on it by hutton took and tore it to pieces and then trampled the fragments under his feet others having discovered several copies of luther's captivity of babylon carried them off and tore them the people indignant rushed upon the soldiers and obliged them to take flight on another occasion a spanish horseman with drawn sword was seen in one of the principal streets of worms in pursuit of a german who was fleeing before him while the people durst not interfere some politicians thought that they had discovered a method of saving luther recant your errors in doctrine said they to him but persist in all you have said against the pope and his court and you are safe aleander shuddered at this advice but luther immovable in his purpose declared that he set little value on a political reform if not founded on faith the eighteenth of april having arrived glapio the chancellor eck and aleander met at an early hour by the order of charles v to fix the course of procedure in regard to luther luther had been for a moment overawed on the evening before when he had to appear before so august an assembly his heart had been agitated at the sight of so many princes before whom great kingdoms humbly bent the knee the thought that he was going to refuse obedience to men whom god had invested with sovereign power gave him deep concern and he felt the necessity of seeking strength from a higher source he who attacked by the enemy holds the shield of faith said he one day is like perseus holding the head of the gorgon on which whoever looked that moment died so ought we to hold up the son of god against the snares of the devil on this morning of the eighteenth of april he had moments of trouble when the face of god was hid from him his faith becomes faint his enemies seem to multiply before him his imagination is overpowered his soul is like a ship tossed by a violent tempest now plunged to the depths of the sea and again mounting up towards heaven 
at this hour of bitter sorrow when he drinks the cup of christ and feels as it were in a garden of gethsemane he turns his face to the ground and sends forth broken cries cries which we cannot comprehend unless we figure to ourselves the depth of the agony from which they ascended up to god god almighty god eternal how terrible is the world how it opens its mouth to swallow me up and how defective my confidence in thee how weak the flesh how powerful satan if i must put my hope in that which the world calls powerful i am undone the knell is struck and judgment is pronounced o god o god o thou my god assist me against all the wisdom of the world do it thou must do it thou alone for it is not my work but thine i have nothing to do here i have nothing to do contending thus with the mighty of the world i too would like to spend tranquil and happy days but the cause is thine and it is just and everlasting o lord be my help faithful god immutable god i trust not in any man that were vain all that is of man vacillates all that comes of man gives way o god o god dost thou not hear my god art thou dead no thou canst not die thou only hidest thyself thou hast chosen me for this work i know it act then o god stand by my side for the sake of thy well-beloved son jesus christ who is my defence my buckler and my fortress after a moment of silence and wrestling he continues thus lord where standest thou o oh, my god where art thou come come i am ready i am ready to give up my life for thy truth patient as a lamb for the cause is just and it is thine i will not break off from thee either now or through eternity and though the world should be filled with devils though my body which however is the work of thy hands should bite the dust be racked on the wheel cut in pieces ground to powder my soul is thine yes thy word is my pledge my soul belongs to thee and will be eternally near thee amen o oh god help me amen this prayer explains luther and the reformation history here lifts the veil of the sanctuary and shows us the secret place whence strength and courage were imparted to this humble man who was the instrument of god in emancipating the soul and the thoughts of men and beginning a new era luther and the reformation are here seen in actual operation we perceive their most secret springs we discover where their power lay this meditation by one who is sacrificing himself to the cause of truth is found among the collection of pieces relating to luther's appearance at worms under number sixteen among safe conducts and other documents of a similar description some of his friends doubtless extended it and so have preserved it to us in my opinion it is one of the finest documents on record luther after he had thus prayed found that peace of mind without which no man can do anything great he read the word of god he glanced over his writings and endeavoured to put his reply into proper shape the thought that he was going to bear testimony to jesus christ and his word in the presence of the emperor and the empire filled his heart with joy the moment of appearance was drawing near he went up with emotion to the sacred volume which was lying open on his table put his left hand upon it and lifting his right toward heaven swore to remain faithful to the gospel and to confess his faith freely should he even seal his confession with his blood after doing so he felt still more at peace at four o'clock the herald presented himself and conducted him to the place where the diet sat the general curiosity had increased for the reply behoved to be decisive 
the diet being engaged luther was obliged to wait in the court in the middle of an immense crowd who moved to and fro like a troubled sea and pressed the reformer with its waves the doctor spent two long hours amidst this gazing multitude i was not used said he to all these doings and all this noise it would have been a sad preparation for an ordinary man but luther was with god his eye was serene his features unruffled the eternal had placed him upon a rock night began to fall and the lamps were lighted in the hall of the diet their glare passed through the ancient windows and shone into the court everything assumed a solemn aspect at last the doctor was introduced many persons entered with him for there was an eager desire to hear his answer all minds were on the stretch waiting impatiently for the decisive moment which now approached this time luther was free calm self-possessed and showed not the least appearance of being under constraint prayer had produced its fruits the princes having taken their seats not without difficulty for their places were almost invaded and the monk of wittemberg again standing in front of charles v the chancellor of the elector of treves rose up and said martin luther you yesterday asked a delay which is now expired assuredly it might have been denied you since every one ought to be sufficiently instructed in matters of faith to be able always to render an account of it to whoever asks you above all so great and able a doctor of holy scripture now then reply to the question of his majesty who has treated you with so much mildness do you mean to defend your books out and out or do you mean to retract some part of them these words which the chancellor had spoken in latin he repeated in german then dr martin luther say the acts of worms replied in the most humble and submissive manner he did not raise his voice he spoke not with violence but with candour meekness suitableness and modesty and yet with great joy and christian firmness most serene emperor illustrious princes gracious lords said luther turning his eye on charles and the assembly i this day appear humbly before you according to the order which was given me yesterday and by the mercies of god i implore your majesty and august highnesses to listen kindly to the defence of a cause which i am assured is righteous and true if from ignorance i am wanting in the usages and forms of courts pardon me for i was not brought up in the palaces of kings but in the obscurity of a cloister yesterday two questions were asked of me on the part of his imperial majesty the first if i was the author of the books whose titles were read the second if i was willing to recall or to defend the doctrine which i have taught in them i answered the first question and i adhere to my answer as to the second i have composed books on very different subjects in some i treat of faith and good works in a manner so pure simple and christian that my enemies even far from finding anything to censure confess that these writings are useful and worthy of being read by the godly the papal bull how severe soever it may be acknowledges this were i then to retract these what should i do wretch i should be alone among men abandoning truths which the unanimous voice of my friends and enemies approves and opposing what the whole world glories in confessing in the second place i have composed books against the papacy books in which i have attacked those who by their false doctrine their bad life and scandalous example desolate the christian world and destroy both body and soul is not the fact proved by the complaints of all who fear god is it not evident that the human laws and doctrines of the popes entangle torture martyr the consciences of the faithful while the clamant and never-ending extortions of rome engulf the wealth and riches of christendom and particularly of this illustrious kingdom 
were i to retract what i have written on this subject what should i do what but fortify that tyranny and open a still wider door for these many and great iniquities then breaking forth with more fury than ever these arrogant men would be seen increasing usurping raging more and more and the yoke which weighs upon the christian people would by my retraction not only be rendered more severe but would become so to speak more legitimate for by this very retraction it would have received the confirmation of your most serene majesty and of all the states of the holy empire good god i should thus be as it were an infamous cloak destined to hide and cover all sorts of malice and tyranny thirdly and lastly i have written books against private individuals who wished to defend roman tyranny and to destroy the faith i confess frankly that i have perhaps attacked them with more violence than became my ecclesiastical profession i do not regard myself as a saint but no more can i retract these books because by so doing i should sanction the impiety of my opponents and give them occasion to oppress the people of god with still greater cruelty still i am a mere man and not god i will defend myself as jesus christ did he said if i have spoken evil bear witness of the evil john chapter eighteen verse twenty three how much more should i who am but dust and ashes and so apt to err desire every one to state what he can against my doctrine wherefore i implore you by the mercies of god you most serene emperor and you most illustrious princes and all others of high or low degree to prove to me by the writings of the prophets and the apostles that i am mistaken as soon as this shall have been proved i will forthwith retract all my errors and be the first to seize my writings and cast them into the flames what i have just said shows clearly i think that i have well considered and weighed the dangers to which i expose myself but far from being alarmed it gives me great joy to see that the gospel is now as in former times a cause of trouble and discord this is the characteristic and the destiny of the word of god i came not to send peace but a sword said jesus christ matthew ten verse thirty four god is wonderful and terrible in working let us beware while pretending to put a stop to discord that we do not persecute the holy word of god and bring in upon ourselves a frightful deluge of insurmountable dangers present disasters and eternal destruction let us beware that the reign of this young and noble prince the emperor charles on whom under god we build such high hopes do not only begin but also continue and end under the most fatal auspices i might cite examples taken from the oracles of god continues luther speaking in the presence of the greatest monarch in the world with the noblest courage i might remind you of the pharaohs the kings of babylon and of israel who never laboured more effectually for their ruin than when by councils apparently very wise they thought they were establishing their empire god removeth the mountains and they know not job nine verse five if i speak thus it is not because i think such great princes have need of my counsels but because i wish to restore to germany what she has a right to expect from her children thus commending myself to your august majesty and your serene highnesses i humbly supplicate you not to allow the hatred of my enemies to bring down upon me an indignation which i have not deserved luther had spoken these words in german modestly but also with much warmth and firmness he was ordered to repeat them in latin the emperor had no liking for german the imposing assembly which surrounded the reformer the noise and excitement had fatigued him i was covered with perspiration says he heated by the crowd standing in the midst of the princes 
Frederick de Thun, confidential counsellor of the Elector of Saxony, stationed by his master's order behind the reformer to take care that he was not taken by surprise or overborne, seeing the condition of the poor monk, said to him, If you cannot repeat your address, that will do, doctor. But Luther, having paused a moment to take breath, resumed, and pronounced his address in Latin, with the same vigour as at first this pleased the elector frederick exceedingly relates the reformer as soon as he had ceased the chancellor of treves the orator of the diet said to him indignantly you have not answered the question which was put to you you are not here to throw doubt on what has been decided by councils you are asked to give a clear and definite reply will you or will you not retract luther then replied without hesitation since your most serene majesty and your high mightinesses call upon me for a simple clear and definite answer i will give it and it is this i cannot subject my faith either to the pope or to councils because it is as clear as day that they have often fallen into error and even into great self-contradiction if then i am not disproved by passages of scripture or by clear arguments if i am not convinced by the very passages which i have quoted and so bound in conscience to submit to the word of god i neither can nor will retract anything for it is not safe for a christian to speak against his conscience then looking around on the assembly before which he was standing and which held his life in its hands here i am says he i cannot do otherwise god help me amen thus luther constrained to obey his faith led by his conscience to death impelled by the noblest necessity the slave of what he believes but in this slavery supremely free like to the ship tossed by a fearful tempest which in order to save something more precious than itself is voluntarily allowed to dash itself to pieces against a rock pronounces these sublime words which have not lost their thrilling effect after the lapse of three centuries thus speaks a monk before the emperor and the magnates of the empire and this poor and feeble individual standing alone but leaning on the grace of the most high seems greater and stronger than them all his word has a power against which all these mighty men can do nothing the empire and the church on the one side the obscure individual on the other have been confronted god had assembled these kings and prelates that he might publicly bring their wisdom to naught they have lost the battle and the consequences of their defeat will be felt in all nations and during all future ages the assembly were amazed several princes could scarcely conceal their admiration the emperor changing his first impression exclaimed the monk speaks with an intrepid heart and immovable courage the spaniards and italians alone felt disconcerted and soon began to deride a magnanimity which they could not appreciate after the diet had recovered from the impression produced by the address the chancellor resumed if you do not retract the emperor and the states of the empire will consider what course they must adopt towards an obstinate heretic at these words luther's friends trembled but the monk said again god help me for i can retract nothing luther then withdraws and the princes deliberate every one felt that the moment formed a crisis in christendom the yea or nay of this monk was destined perhaps for ages to determine the condition of the church and the world it was wished to frighten him but the effect had been to place him on a pedestal in the presence of the nation it was meant to give more publicity to his defeat and all that had been done was to extend his victory the partisans of rome could not submit to bear their humiliation luther was recalled and the orator thus addressed him martin you have not spoken with the modesty which became your office the distinction you have made between your books was useless 
for if you retract those which contain errors the empire will not allow the others to be burnt it is extravagant to insist on being refuted from scripture when you revive heresies which were condemned by the universal council of constance the emperor therefore orders you to say simply do you mean to maintain what you have advanced or do you mean to retract any part of it yes or no i have no other answer than that which i have already given replied luther calmly he was now understood firm as a rock all the billows of human power had dashed against him in vain the vigour of his eloquence his intrepid countenance the flashing of his eye the immovable firmness imprinted in bold lineaments on his german features had produced the deepest impression on this illustrious assembly there was no longer any hope spaniards belgians and even romans were mute the monk was victorious over earthly grandeur he had negatived the church and the empire charles rose up and all the assembly with him the diet will meet to-morrow morning to hear the emperor's decision said the chancellor with a loud voice end of book seven chapter eight book seven chapter nine of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine it was night and each regained his dwelling in the dark two imperial officers were ordered to accompany luther some persons imagining that his fate was decided and that they were conducting him to prison which he should leave only for the scaffold an immense tumult arose several gentlemen exclaimed are they taking him to prison no replied luther they are accompanying me to my hotel at these words the tumult calmed then some spaniards of the emperor's household followed this bold champion hissed and jeered at him as he passed along the streets while others howled like wild beasts deprived of their prey luther remained firm and peaceful such was the scene at worms the intrepid monk who had hitherto hurled defiance at his enemies spake when in the presence of those who had thirsted for his blood with calmness dignity and humility there was no exaggeration no human enthusiasm no anger he was peaceful amid the strongest excitement modest while resisting the powers of the earth great in the presence of all the princes of the world in this we have an irrefragable proof that luther was then obeying god not following the suggestions of his own pride in the hall of worms there was one greater than luther and charles jesus christ has said when they deliver you up take no thought how or what you shall speak for it is not ye that speak never perhaps was this promise so manifestly fulfilled a deep impression had been produced on the heads of the empire luther had observed this and it had increased his courage the servants of the pope were angry at john eck for not having oftener interrupted the guilty monk several princes and nobles were gained to a cause which was maintained with such conviction in some it is true the impression was evanescent but on the other hand several who till then had concealed their sentiments henceforth displayed great courage luther had returned to his hotel and was reposing from the fatigue of the severe service in which he had been engaged spalatin and other friends were around him and all were giving thanks to god while they were conversing a valet entered bearing a silver vase full of einbeck beer my master said he presenting it to luther begs you to refresh yourself with this draught of beer what prince is it said luther who so graciously remembers me it was old duke eric of brunswick the reformer was touched by the offering thus made him by so powerful a prince one too belonging to the papal party 
his highness continued the valet was pleased to taste the draught before sending it to you luther being thirsty poured out the duke's beer and after drinking it said as duke eric has this day remembered me so may the lord jesus christ remember him in the day of his final combat the present was in itself of little value but luther wishing to show his gratitude to a prince who had thought of him at such a moment gave him what he had a prayer the valet returned with the message to his master the old duke in his last moments remembered the words and addressing a young page francis de cram who was standing at his bedside said to him take the gospel and read it to me the child read the words of christ and the soul of the dying man was refreshed whosoever says the saviour shall give to one of you a cup of cold water in my name because you are my disciple verily i say unto you he shall in no wise lose his reward the valet of the duke of brunswick was no sooner gone than a message from the elector of saxony ordered spalatin to come to him instantly frederick had come to the diet full of disquietude he thought that in the presence of the emperor luther's courage might give way and he had accordingly been deeply moved by the reformer's firmness he was proud of having taken such a man under his protection when the chaplain arrived the table was covered and the elector was going to sit down to supper with his court the valets having already brought in the vase for washing the hands the elector seeing spalatin enter immediately beckoned him to follow and when alone with him in his bedchamber said to him with deep emotion oh how well father luther spoke before the emperor and all the states of the empire my only fear was that he would be too bold frederick then formed a resolution to protect the doctor in future with greater courage aleander saw the impression which luther had produced there was no time therefore to be lost the young emperor must be induced to act vigorously the moment was favourable for there was immediate prospect of war with france leo x wishing to enlarge his states and caring little for the peace of christendom caused two treaties to be secretly negotiated at the same time the one with charles against francis and the other with francis against charles by the former he stipulated with the emperor for parma placenza and ferrara by the latter he stipulated with the king for a part of the kingdom of naples of which charles was thus to be deprived charles felt the importance of gaining over leo in order that he might have him as an ally against his rival of france luther was an easy price to pay for the friendship of the mighty pontiff the day after luther's appearance he caused a message to be read to the diet which he had written in french with his own hand sprung said he from the christian emperors of germany from the catholic kings of spain the archdukes of austria and the dukes of burgundy who are all illustrious as defenders of the roman faith it is my firm purpose to follow the example of my ancestors a single monk led astray by his own folly sets himself up in opposition to the faith of christendom i will sacrifice my dominions my power my friends my treasure my body my blood my mind and my life to stay this impiety i mean to send back the augustine luther forbidding him to cause the least tumult among the people thereafter i will proceed against him and his adherents as against declared heretics by excommunication and interdict and all means proper for their destruction i call upon the members of the states to conduct themselves like faithful christians this address did not please everybody charles young and impassioned had not observed the ordinary forms he ought previously to have asked the opinion of the diet two extreme views were immediately declared the creatures of the pope the elector of brandenburg and several ecclesiastical princes demanded that no regard should be paid to the safe conduct which had been given to luther 
the rhine said they must receive his ashes as a century ago it received the ashes of john huss charles if we may believe a historian afterwards bitterly repented that he had not followed this dastardly counsel i confess said he towards the close of his life that i committed a great fault in allowing luther to live that heretic having offended a greater master than i even god himself i was not obliged to keep my promise to him i might nay i ought to have forgotten my word and avenged the insult which he offered to god because i did not put him to death the heresy has not ceased to gain strength his death would have strangled it in the cradle this horrible proposition filled the elector and all luther's friends with terror the execution of john huss said the elector palatine brought too many calamities on germany to allow such a scaffold to be erected a second time the princes of germany exclaimed george of saxony himself the irreconcilable enemy of luther will not allow a safe conduct to be violated this first diet held by our new emperor will not incur the guilt of an act so disgraceful such perfidy accords not with old german integrity the princes of bavaria also devoted to the church of rome joined in this protestation the death scene which luther's friends had already before their eyes appeared to be withdrawn the rumours of these debates which lasted for two days spread over the town parties grew warm some gentlemen partisans of reform began to speak strongly against the treachery demanded by aleander the emperor said they is a young man whom the papists and bishops lead at pleasure by their flattery pallavicini makes mention of four hundred nobles who were ready to maintain luther's safe conduct with the sword on saturday morning placards were found posted up on the houses and public places some against luther and others in his favour one of them merely contained the energetic words of ecclesiastes woe to thee o land when thy king is a child Seckingen, it was said had assembled at some leagues from worms behind the impregnable ramparts of his fortress a large body of knights and soldiers and only waited the issue of the affair that he might know how to act the popular enthusiasm not only in worms but also in the most distant towns of the empire the intrepidity of the knights the attachment of several princes to the reformer all must have made charles and the diet comprehend that the step demanded by the romans might compromise the supreme authority excite revolts and even shake the empire it was only a simple monk that they proposed to burn but the princes and partisans of rome taken all together had neither power nor courage enough to do it doubtless also charles v their young emperor had still a fear of perjury this would seem indicated by an expression which if some historian speak true he uttered on this occasion were fidelity and good faith banished from the whole world they ought to find an asylum in the hearts of princes it is said he forgot this when on the brink of the grave but there were other motives which might have had their influence on the emperor the florentine vettori a friend of leo x and of machiavelli affirms that charles spared luther only that he might keep the pope in check on the saturday's sitting the violent counsels of aleander were negatived there was a feeling in favour of luther and a wish to save the simple-hearted man whose confidence in god was so affecting but there was also a wish to save the church the diet shuddered equally at the consequences which would result from the triumph and from the destruction of the reformer proposals of conciliation were heard and it was suggested that a new attempt should be made with the doctor of wittemberg the archbishop elector of mentz himself the young and extravagant albert more devout than courageous says pallavicini had taken alarm on seeing the interest which the people and the nobility showed in the saxon monk his chaplain capito who during his residence at Baal, had been intimate with the evangelical priest of zurich named zwinglius 
the intrepid defender of the truth of whom we have already had occasion to speak had also doubtless represented to albert the righteousness of the reformer's cause the worldly archbishop had one of those returns to christian sentiment which his life occasionally exhibits and agreed to go to the emperor and ask him to allow one last attempt but charles flatly refused on monday the twenty second of april the princes met in a body to renew the solicitations of albert i will not depart from what i have decreed replied the emperor i will not commission any person to go officially to luther but added he to the great scandal of aleander i give this man three days to reflect during this time any one may as an individual give him suitable advice this was all that was asked the reformer thought they elevated by the solemnity of his public appearance will yield in a more friendly conference and perhaps be saved from the abyss into which he is ready to fall the elector of saxony knew the contrary accordingly he was in great fear if it were in my power wrote he the next day to his brother duke john i would be ready to support luther you could not believe to what a degree i am attacked by the partisans of rome if i could tell you all you would hear very strange things they are bent on his ruin and however slight interest any one shows for his person he is immediately decried as a heretic may god who forsakes not the righteous cause bring all to a good end frederick without showing the strong affection which he felt for the reformer contented himself with not losing sight of any of his movements it was not so with men of all ranks then in worms many fearlessly gave full vent to their sympathy from the friday a crowd of princes counts barons knights gentlemen ecclesiastics laics and common people surrounded the hotel where the reformer lodged they came in and went out and could not see enough of him he was become the man in germany even those who doubted not that he was in error were touched by the nobleness of soul which had led him to sacrifice his life at the bidding of his conscience with several of the personages present at worms and forming the flower of the nation luther had occasionally conversations full of that salt with which his sayings were always seasoned none left him without feeling animated with a generous enthusiasm for the truth george vogler the private secretary of the margrave casimir of brandenburg writing to a friend says what things i should have to tell you what conversations full of piety and kindness luther has had with myself and others how winning that man is one day a young prince of seventeen came prancing into the court of the hotel it was philip who had been reigning for two years in hesse the young landgrave was of an active and enterprising character of a wisdom beyond his years a martial spirit and an impetuous temper seldom allowing himself to be guided by any ideas but his own struck with luther's addresses he wished to have a nearer view of him as yet however says luther in relating his visit he was not for me he dismounted and without any other formality came up into the reformer's room and addressing him said well dear doctor how goes it gracious lord replied luther i hope it will go well from what i learn resumed the landgrave laughing you teach doctor that a wife may quit her husband and take another when the former is found to be too old the people of the imperial court had told this story to the landgrave the enemies of the truth never fail to circulate fabulous accounts of the lessons of christian teachers no my lord replied luther gravely let your highness not speak so if you please thereupon the prince briskly held out his hand to the doctor shook his cordially and said dear doctor if you are in the right may god assist you on this he left the room again mounted his horse and rode off this was the first interview between these two men who were afterwards to stand at the head of the reformation and to defend it the one with the sword of the word 
and the other with the sword of kings it was the archbishop of treves richard de greifenclan who with permission of charles v had undertaken the office of mediator richard who was on an intimate footing with the elector of saxony and a good roman catholic was desirous to arrange this difficult affair and thereby at once do a service to his friend and to the church on monday evening twenty second of april just as luther was going to sit down to table a messenger of the archbishop came to say that the prelate wished to see him the day after to-morrow wednesday at six o'clock in the morning End of Book 7, Chapter 9book seven chapter ten of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten that day the chaplain and the imperial herald sturm were both at luther's before six o'clock in the morning aleander had caused cochleus to be called at four the nuncio had not been slow in discovering in the man who had been presented to him by capito a devoted servant of rome on whom he could calculate as on himself not being able to be present at this interview aleander wished to have a substitute at it be present at the archbishop of treves said he to the dean of frankfurt do not enter into discussion with luther but content yourself with paying the closest attention to everything that is said so as to be able to bring me back a faithful report the reformer on arriving with some friends at the house of the archbishop found him surrounded by the margrave joachim of brandenburg and augsburg several nobles deputies from free towns lawyers and theologians among whom were cochleus and jerome vehe chancellor of baden the latter an able lawyer wished a reformation in manners and discipline he went even further the word of god said he which has so long been hid under the bushel must reappear in all its lustre this conciliatory individual was entrusted with the conference turning kindly towards luther he said to him we did not make you come in order to dispute with you but in order to give you brotherly advice you know how carefully the scripture requireth us to guard against the flying arrow and the devil that walketh at noonday this enemy of the human race has instigated you to publish things contrary to religion think of your own safety and that of the empire take care that those whom jesus christ has ransomed by his own death from death eternal be not seduced by you and perish for ever do not set yourself up against holy counsels if we do not maintain the decrees of our fathers there will be nothing but confusion in the church the distinguished princes now listening to me take a particular interest in your safety but if you persist the emperor will banish you from the empire and no place in the world will be able to offer you an asylum reflect on the fate which awaits you most serene princes replied luther i give you thanks for your solicitude for i am only a poor man and am too humble to be exhorted by such high lords then he continued i have not blamed all the councils but only that of constance because in condemning this doctrine of john huss that is that the christian church is the assembly of those who are predestinated to salvation it condemned this article of our creed i believe in the holy catholic church and the word of god itself my lessons it is said give offence added he i answer that the gospel of christ cannot be preached without offence how then should this fear or apprehension of danger detach me from the lord and from this divine word which is the only truth no rather give my body my blood and my life the princes and doctors having deliberated luther was recalled and vehe mildly resumed 
it is necessary to honour princes even when they are mistaken and to make great sacrifices to charity then he said in a more urgent tone cast yourself upon the judgment of the emperor and have no fear luther i consent with all my heart that the emperor the princes and even the humblest christian shall examine and judge my books but on one condition and it is that they take the word of god for their standard men have nothing else to do but to obey my conscience is dependent upon it and i am captive under its authority the elector of brandenburg i understand you perfectly doctor you will not acknowledge any judge but the holy scripture luther yes my lord exactly that is my last word then the princes and doctors withdrew but the worthy archbishop of treves could not resolve to abandon his undertaking come said he to luther as he passed into his private room and at the same time ordered john eck and cochleus on the one side and scherf and amsdorf on the other to follow them why appeal incessantly to the holy scriptures said eck keenly out of it all heresies have sprung but luther says his friend mathesius remained immovable like a rock resting on the true rock the word of the lord the pope replied he is no judge in things pertaining to the word of god every christian must see and understand for himself how he ought to live and die the parties separated the partisans of the papacy felt luther's superiority and attributed it to there being nobody present who could answer him if the emperor says cochleus had acted wisely in calling luther to worms he would also have called theologians who might have refuted his errors the archbishop of treves repaired to the diet and announced the ill success of his mediation the surprise of the young emperor equalled his indignation it is time said he to put an end to this affair the archbishop asked two days more and the whole diet seconded him charles v yielded aleander transported with rage uttered the bitterest invectives while these things were passing at the diet cochleus was burning with eagerness to gain a victory denied to prelates and kings though he had from time to time thrown in a few words at the archbishops the order which he had received from aleander had laid him under restraint he resolved to compensate himself and had no sooner given an account of his mission to the papal nuncio than he presented himself at luther's lodging he accosted him as a friend and expressed the grief which he felt at the emperor's resolution after dinner the conversation grew animated cochleus pressed luther to retract he declined by a nod several nobles who were at the table had difficulty in restraining themselves they were indignant that the partisans of rome should not wish to convince the reformer by scripture but constrain him by force cochleus impatient under these reproaches says to luther very well i offer to dispute publicly with you if you renounce the safe conduct all that luther demanded was a public debate what ought he to do to renounce the safe conduct was to be his own destroyer to refuse the challenge of cochleus was to appear doubtful of his cause the guests regarded the offer as a perfidious scheme of aleander whom the dean of frankfurt had just left Fulrat of watzdorf one of the number freed luther from the embarrassment of this puzzling alternative this baron who was of a boiling temperament indignant at a snare which aimed at nothing less than to give up luther into the hands of the executioner started up seized the terrified priest and pushed him to the door there would even have been bloodshed had not the other guests risen up from the table and interposed their mediation between the furious baron and the trembling cochleus who withdrew in confusion from the hotel of the knights of rhodes the expression had no doubt escaped the dean in the heat of discussion and was not a premeditated scheme between him and aleander to make luther fall into a perfidious snare cochleus denies that it was 
and we have pleasure in giving credit to his testimony though it is true he had come to luther's from a conference with the nuncio in the evening the archbishop of treves entertained those who had been present at the morning conference he thought it might be a means of calming down their minds and bringing them nearer each other luther who was so intrepid and immovable before arbiters or judges had in private society a good humour and gaiety which seemed to promise anything that might be asked of him the archbishop's chancellor who had shown so much sternness in his official capacity joined in the attempt and towards the end of the repast drank luther's health he was preparing to return the honour the wine was poured out and he was according to his custom making the sign of the cross on his glass when suddenly the glass burst in his hands and the wine was spilt on the table the guests were in consternation there must be poison in it said some of luther's friends quite loud but the doctor without being moved replied with a smile dear friends either this wine was not destined for me or it would have been hurtful to me then he calmly added the glass burst no doubt because in washing it had been too soon plunged in cold water these simple words in the circumstances in which they were uttered have some degree of grandeur and bespeak unalterable peace we cannot suppose that the roman catholics could have wished to poison luther especially at the house of the archbishop of treves this repast neither estranged nor approximated the parties the reformer's resolution came from a higher source and could not be influenced either by the hatred or the favour of men on thursday morning twenty fifth of april chancellor wehe and dr peutinger of augsburg imperial councillor who had shown great affection for luther ever since his interview with de vio repaired to the hotel of the knights of rhodes the elector of saxony sent frederick de thun and another of his councillors to be present at the conference put yourselves in our hands earnestly said wehe and peutinger who would willingly have sacrificed everything to prevent the division which was about to rend the church this affair will be terminated in a christian manner we give you our word for it in two words said luther to them here is my answer i renounce the safe conduct i place in the hands of the emperor my person and my life but the word of god never frederick de thun affected rose and said to the deputies is it not enough is not the sacrifice great enough then declaring that he would hear nothing more he took his leave wehe and peutinger hoping to have better success with the doctor came and sat down on each side of him throw yourself upon the diet said they to him no replied luther for cursed be the man that trusteth in man jeremiah seventeen verse five wehe and peutinger redoubled their counsels and attacks pressing more closely on the reformer luther worn out rose up and put an end to the interview saying i will not allow any man to set himself above the word of god reflect once more said they to him on retiring we will return after midday they in fact did return but convinced that luther would not yield they brought a new proposal luther had refused to be judged first by the pope then by the emperor then by the diet there remained one judge to whom he himself had once appealed a general council no doubt such a proposal would have been scouted by rome but it was the last plank for escape the delegates offered luther a council and he had it in his power to accept it unfettered by any precise definition years might have elapsed before the difficulties which the calling of a council would have encountered on the part of the pope could have been obviated to the reformation and the reformer a gain of years would have gained everything god and time would then have done the rest but luther preferred the straight course to every other he would not save himself at the expense of truth though all that might have been necessary was to disguise it by keeping silence i consent replied he but this was equivalent to a refusal of the council 
on condition that the council will judge only according to the holy scriptures poitinger and vehe thinking that a council could not judge otherwise hastened overjoyed to the archbishop dr martin said they submits his books to a council the archbishop was going to carry the good news to the emperor when some doubt occurring to him he sent for luther richard of griefenklau was alone when the doctor arrived dear doctor said the archbishop with much cordiality and kindness my doctors assure me that you consent without reservation to submit your cause to a council my lord replied luther i can bear everything but cannot abandon the holy scriptures the archbishop then perceived that vehe and poitinger had not explained themselves properly never could rome consent to a council bound to decide according to scripture it was just says pallavicini to insist that a weak eye should read very small writing and at the same time deny the use of spectacles the good archbishop sighed it was well said he i have made you come what would have become of me had i immediately gone to the emperor with the news the immovable firmness the stern rectitude of luther are no doubt astonishing but they will be comprehended and respected by all who know the claims of god seldom has a nobler homage been paid to the immutable word of heaven and that at the risk of life and liberty by the man who paid it well said the venerable prelate to luther do you yourself then point out a remedy luther after a moment's silence my lord i know no other than that of gamaliel if this counsel or this work be of men it will come to naught but if it be of god ye cannot overthrow it lest haply ye be found even to fight against god let the emperor the electors the princes and the states of the empire deliver this answer to the pope archbishop at least retract some articles luther provided it be not those which the council of constance condemned archbishop ah i fear they are the very ones which will be asked luther then sooner sacrifice my body and my life better allow my legs and arms to be cut off than abandon the clear and genuine word of god the archbishop at length understood luther you may withdraw said he to him always with the same gentleness your lordship resumed luther will be so good as to see that his majesty cause the safe conduct necessary for my return to be expedited i will see to it replied the good archbishop and they parted so ended these negotiations the whole empire had assailed this man with the most urgent entreaties and the most fearful menaces and this man had never flinched his refusal to bend under the iron arm of the pope emancipated the church and commenced a new era the intervention of providence was evident and the whole presents one of those grand historical scenes in which the majestic form of the divinity appears conspicuously displayed luther withdrew in company with spalatin who had arrived at the archbishops during the course of the visit john von minkwitz one of the elector of saxony's councillors had fallen sick at worms the two friends repaired to his lodging and luther administered the tenderest consolation to the sick man adieu said he to him on leaving to-morrow i shall quit worms luther was not mistaken he had not been three hours returned to the hotel of the knights of rhodes when chancellor eck and the chancellor of the emperor with a notary made their appearance the chancellor said to him martin luther his imperial majesty the electors princes and states of the empire having exhorted you to submission again and again and in various manners but always in vain the emperor in his quality of advocate and defender of the catholic faith sees himself obliged to take other steps he therefore orders you to return to your home in the space of twenty-one days and prohibits you from disturbing the public peace by the way either by preaching or writing luther was well aware that this message was the first step in his condemnation 
it has happened as jehovah pleased said he meekly blessed be the name of jehovah then he added before all things very humbly and from the bottom of my heart i thank his majesty the electors princes and other states of the empire for having listened to me with so much kindness i have desired and do desire one thing only a reformation of the church agreeably to holy scripture i am ready to do everything and suffer everything in humble submission to the will of the emperor life and death honour and disgrace are all alike to me i make only one reservation the preaching of the gospel for says st paul the word of god cannot be bound the deputies withdrew on the morning of friday twenty sixth of april the reformers friends and several nobles met at his lodgings they were gratified at seeing the christian constancy which he had opposed to charles and the empire and to recognize in him the features of the ancient portrait justum ac tenacem propositi virum non civium ardor prava jubentium non vultus instantis tyranni mente quatit solida that is the man who is tenacious of purpose in a rightful course is not shaken from his firm resolve by the frenzy of his fellow-citizens clamouring for what is wrong or by the tyrant's threatening countenance they wished once more perhaps for ever to bid adieu to this intrepid monk luther took a frugal meal now he must take leave of his friends and flee far from them under a sky surcharged with storms he wished to pass this solemn moment in the presence of god he lifted up his soul and blessed those who were around him ten in the morning having struck luther quitted the hotel with the friends who had accompanied him to worms twenty gentlemen on horseback surrounded his carriage a great crowd accompanied him beyond the walls the imperial herald sturm rejoined him some time after at oppenheim and the following day they reached frankfurt end of book seven chapter ten